So my name is Gwen Randolph and I am uh, uh, from WashU uh, uh, School of Medicine here in the Department of Pathology. I don't have financial disclosures in part because my you know, sad disclosure is I right now don't work on live edema, uh, but I do work in the area of uh, fat accumulation and its relationship between lymphatic impairment and vascular instability. And I think all of these um, uh, uh, processes are processes that are relevant to lipedema, um, and, um, um, and so you know I, I hope that you would hear me out, and then we can discuss about how uh, we could move to this in the future in the lipedema. And you're going to hear from uh, Eva Savek in the next talk, where she's going to talk a lot about imaging lipedema patients in lymphatics, and we both uh, come from the lymphatic world of research. And so in this slide, um, it's a cartoon that I drew of skin. So here you have the epidermis. A number of different immune cells are actually passing uh, into this tissue and live in this tissue. And for many years, I studied how they uh, leave tissues by the lymphatic. So the lymphatic is here. And just like, I think, if you think about the drains that uh, take material out of your house, they start in your house, in the, in the skin, these lymphatics are blind-ended and they start in the tissues uh, where it's relevant. So they take up these cells and they also take up water, nutrients, proteins, and lipoproteins that need to be removed from tissue. So when you have fluid accumulation, it can be the case that this uh, uh, sewage system, if you will, the lymphatic capillaries, and many people would argue it's much more than a sewage system, but in many ways it does function in that way, could be uh, less functional, so you have accumulation of this. You also see a, a vein here. If these veins are incredibly unstable or, or hyperpermeable, more of the water and fluid can get out. So really, we're thinking about a balance uh, uh, between these two circulatory systems in tissues. Now, the adipose tissue is not shown here because adipose tissue is a little deeper, um, is that the skin is here, and below the skin are um, another type of lymphatic vessel that sits in adipose tissue. So you have this, what you call subcutaneous fat. You probably hear that a bit. That can actually uh, uh, expand quite a lot in lipedema, and it, it controls, it holds a different type of vessel in the lymphatic system. It's like the pump stations in a sewage system. So, so this uh, is what I showed you earlier. This is the fat, the white. Uh, the, so what we've learned is that fat often co-localizes with these specialized transport vessels, and this is the lymph node. So all of this is subcutaneous fat. And inside of these fat, these vessels pump. And the, uh, the pumping action is going to be shown here, a vessel that has been isolated by one of my colleagues, Josh Scallon, who was at the University of Missouri before he moved to Florida. And in just a second here, you're going to see that these vessels that sit in fat actually contract. And if you think about using a syringe in your kitchen to move um, uh, water from one place to another, they create a suction force that allows that flow to, to happen from the tissue. And one of the ways that they contract is that they're surrounded by what you can see here in green, some muscle that facilitates this contraction. So this vessel is the vessel that's really closely associated, always runs with adipose tissue, and we don't really know why. So a few years ago, and this is where I'll spend a, uh, uh, the, most of my remaining minutes, we got interested in what is the connection between these pumping lymphatics and uh, fat that expands in a curious way. And we didn't know a lot about lipedema at the time, but we were approached by physicians who said, think about Crohn's disease. What's really interesting, and we did hear about the, the gut and inflammation earlier, Crohn's disease is a form of inflammatory bowel disease. And what attracted us to start studying the disease is that it's not um, um, uh, very well known, but surgeons will always tell you that if you want to know where the disease is most problematic when you open a patient for surgery, you look for the area where fat has grown up onto the gut wall. So normally, that the relationship and the border is, is quite clear and, and highly respected. But when the disease gets underway, fat begins to expand and grow up onto the gut wall. And we were curious about this, and especially because uh, my clinical collaborator, jean frederic Colombel, who's in New York, showed me uh, data that made us think that it might be related to lymphatics, that the expansion of fat could be related to dysfunctional lymphatics. And so what he did to uh, look at that 
was to inject dyes into the submucosa of the intestine. And you can see in a normal scenario, the dye would move through those vessels that run through fat, kind of like I pictured earlier, although in the gut they're slightly different in orientation. They run straight over to the lymph nodes and straight out. But in the patients who have the disease, and you can see expanding fat here and expanding fat here growing on the gut wall, when he injects the dyes, the dyes often kind of deviate over to the side, um, appear to and potentially just end. And if you can see this here, it's a bit faint, but the blue dye runs right at the fringe of where this border of fat is expanding. So we begin to think about the possibility that fat expansion and lymphatic dysfunction were associated in this uh, disease. So what we have been doing recently, and this is also a project that's fairly uh, young and just getting underway, is that we take the surgically resected material. So this is a portion of the intestinal wall here, and then you can see all of the uh, mesenteric fat where the lymphatics normally run uh, on this side. We're slicing the tissue in a way that we can really see vessels in a three-dimensional uh, 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 view. We, we take these tissues and we can clear them to make them all really quite visible in the microscope. They almost look like pieces of glass. And when we first run them through the microscope, we get an image that looks like this. And I, I've lost my scale bar here, but this is, again, actually most of this several centimeters of fat is covered in this image. And we've removed the intestinal wall here to make the whole tissue flatter. But what you can see by the way we're imaging is that we can find lymph nodes. And we've come to realize that these little bumps along the lymphatic that lead to this lymph node are, in fact, uh, inflammatory obstructions. And then what's, what surprised us, what we didn't know, was that the artery and venous vascular church would show great instability. And so I'm going to show you now some sections. This is all mesenteric adipose tissue. So there's lots of little fat cells in here. Uh, hard to see because we didn't try to light them up in any specific way. Uh, but this is an artery and this is a vein. And even if you're not a person who's like looking at these tissues a lot, I think you can see that this looks very strange. It has this growth in the middle of it. Um, and here's a bigger picture of a, a, of a different patient where the vein has almost uh, a, a very strange, the, 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 the muscle that sits around the, the vein is now growing inside and also growing on the outside of the vessel and escaping into the adipose tissue. So both the muscle and the adipose tissue are expanding. And when this is happening in a vein, you have to argue it's incredibly unstable. And if you look at these uh, veins in a way that a pathologist would using this pink stain called H&E, uh, the, the, what we understand from uh, our pathological colleagues is that there's tons of fluid in this venous wall. And these are the muscle cells. They normally should look just like this. And now they're all disarrayed and full of fluid. So here again, it looks like in Crohn's disease, our surprise is that venous instability uh, together with edema, lymphatic obstructions, and fat expansion. So the questions that we're trying to address is what, how these things clearly coexist, what's promoting the fat expansion? And then the, the, the larger question in the room is, is there a relationship between what, what's promoting fat expansion here and lipedema? We have two things that we think might be relevant, and we're in the middle of trying to iron these out. One idea is that the lymph carries, as I was saying, it carries material out of your tissues. A lot of what it carries is rich in fat. So fat cells like to take up fat. So maybe if the vessel is really leaky, and I could, uh, I, uh, uh, we have um, uh, processes uh, underway in which we can see that sometimes the vessel is so leaky that if you run a dye through it, you can see the dye escaping as compared with how it should normally be just transporting uh, uh, the dye. Uh, so maybe the, the fat growth around these vessels is actually due to excessive leakiness of the lymphatic. An alternative idea, which actually I think um, uh, deserves equal consideration, and maybe both are relevant, is the following. So it turns out that stem cells that can give rise to fat cells, and sometimes these uh, cells are called preadipocytes, or even mesenchymal or mesenchymal stem cells, they actually sit in, in vessel walls. Uh, and one of the researchers who's shown this is named John Graff. So th these cells, when they get the right trigger from a neighboring nerve, uh, will actually be triggered to leave the vessel wall. And one question we would un ask ourselves is, if, could it be that in the, in the Crohn's scenario where we see both fat and muscle kind of leaving the wall, is that what's going on there? And maybe that actually destabilizes the vessels and gives rise to the easy bruising and the, and the high leakage that you might envision. 
and that then these cells uh, uh, go on to become the various cell types that they normally would, which includes fat cells, but also uh, potentially other cell types depending on the local uh, environment. So one, one idea to think about is not just the leakage, but actually cells uh, sitting in the wall that might be triggered to become fat cells in an inappropriate way. So I'm going to end here by saying that in Crohn's disease, we're trying to study these relationships. The question would be, uh, and I think we have some leads on directions that I've tried to walk you through, would studies like this be valuable for life edema? And then can studies like this happen for lipedema? One of the obstacles, I think, is that in Crohn's disease, these studies that we're doing are, are patients who are referred to surgery because they have no other option. So we get the tissue just because it's surgical uh, material. For lipedema, one would have to envision that we would take a biopsy, and maybe that's actually not a healthy thing to do in order to be able to look at the tissue in the same way that we've done. But I would be happy to engage in discussion about that. And actually, I end here, and if there are any questions, I would be happy to take um, some. My name is Eva Sevic. I'm from the University of Texas Health Science Center on the Texas Medical Center in Houston. And uh, I have to tell you, this is so wonderful to be here. It's very exciting as a researcher to see um, patients so engaged and therapists so engaged. So I, I really appreciate the invitation to come here. My goal today is just to talk to you a little bit about the overall research picture. And my, 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 the way I'm going to do that, I want to talk about adipose and lymphatics, the genetics connection. And I'm going to warn you that I'm not going to answer the question. But I just... <laughs> Okay, but I just want to show you how we do research. And, you know, these mad scientists with mice running around in the laboratory, how does this all relate to you? So that's, what I, that's my goal um, today, and, and, and I, hope, I hope you find it worthwhile. This is my um, disclosure. I, I think I've been funded from the National Institutes of Health. I've had great funding, and also uh, Tactile Medical Systems has funded us as well. I have to disclose that I have a financial interest in a company that's seeking to commercialize the technology, so you may not want to listen to anything that I have to say because you might think I'm trying to. Um, in any event, I disclosed it. You know, Gwendolyn just did a great job describing the lymphatic circulation. We have this initial capillary bed that's right underneath the skin, and that's the point where we have entry of fluid, particles, foreign material, immune cells, and that initial, those initial capillaries is where material enters in. It then moves into these conducting vessels. I call them the lymph hearts. The lymph angions that pump this fluid to the, the regional lymph nodes where the immune reaction occurs. And then that all goes back into the, into the um, blood circulation. What we've done is we're trying to develop a means to image this in humans. Okay, and we started out with humans. We didn't go to mice first. We started out in humans. And the way that we did this, this was after the first Gulf War. Um, you know, we saw um, the military um, looking at the Iraq soldiers invading Kuwait at night, and so they used night goggle technology. And so what I did is I developed a technique where I could use a dye that's near infrared fluorescent, that's excited at near infrared light. It penetrates through several centimeters of tissue, and it fluoresces. And then we use this technology to collect the fluorescence. Kind of weird. Um, most people didn't think we could do this. And I was kind of, and FDA basically just didn't believe it either. We hardly believed it, but it worked. And unfortunately, we weren't really trying to look at the lymphatics, but we saw the lymphatics. Let me show you. These are the lymphatics in the leg. We put a little bit of dye right underneath the tissue, so it goes into that, those initial capillaries. And what you see is the movement. Hopefully, you can see the movement of lymph in the legs. That's the knee. Those are where the ankles are. Can you see that now? OK. That's lymph actually moving. That's when you, and I always think about when I do exercise, I kind of always think about the lymph moving. You know, I kind of feel that flow. In, in Chinese medicine, it's called the qi. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's your life force. That's what looks like in normal. And um, the question that we've been asking is, is can we look at dysfunction in, in the lymphatics and we, can we relate it to genetics? And I want to give you two examples of that. One in a, in a case that we've published quite some time, but it gives a great idea of how we pair human studies and animal studies. It's in this Park-Weber syndrome. And then I want to tell you some work that we've done with Karen Herps on, on, on Durkheim's um, disease. So let me get started with the first case. This is a 20-year-old male who presented with a capillary stain. See the capillary stain? 
on his leg. And he was, he was born with this at, at birth. And at puberty, he started oozing this, this white fluid from his abdomen. And we think that that was chyle. That was the lymphatic from the mesentery. And, and the problem was this is getting worse as he's getting older and older. And this is called capillary malformation, AV malformation. All blood vessels, you know, no lymphatics. But you can see that looks like it's swollen, doesn't it? OK, so, so um, he presented into our clinic. His father had a small capillary stain as well, suggesting that there's a familiar disease that's going on. There might, and this might be something that, we, that, that this, child, this, this young, young man inherited from, from his father. So what we did is we imaged the lymphatics, because this chyle was coming from his abdomen. And in order to understand, I have to show you what normal lymphatics look like. These are the lymphatics on the inside of your leg here. Isn't that cool? Look at that pumping. Isn't that wild? And the more athletic you are, the better your lymphatics are. In fact, I was the first person in my trial because I wanted to see what I was putting people through. And they, they imaged me. And I said, oh, OK, I have lymphatics. And then we started seeing all these athletes. And they had incredible lymphatics. <laughs> so I started running, <laughs> moving. And a couple months ago, I somehow got into my own trial again. And I have gorgeous lymphatics. <laughs> this gentleman, this little, this, this, this young man, we looked at his normal leg. And look what we found. Those are, if you watch, the, I hope you can see this. These are actually very dilated lymph vessels that, that sluggishly push lymph. And we think, and from animal studies, we think that these dilated vessels occur because of a pro-inflammatory state. Now, what's really sad about this person is that these vessels, lymph vessels, in the normal leg actually dumped into his abdomen, mixed with the mesentery, and the, the, the white fluid was fluorescent. So basically, the lymphatics in the leg was mixing with the lymphatics in the mesentery and oozing out. He's, he's in bad shape. Some of these people end up having lymph fluid leakage into the lung. So what we did is we actually did the sequencing. You know, what you do is you do next generation sequencing. We're not doing the whole genome. We're doing an exome. And basically what we're doing is we're looking at those mutations that dad and the son had that nobody else in the population, because it's a rare disorder. And we found that there was an, act an inactivation, an early inactivation, that deleted a protein. OK? This protein was not present. And so we thought, well, OK, that might be the cause of the disease. And so if that protein's not present, maybe we can find a drug to replace that, that, that protein, OK? Um, so in, in research, when you find something like this, you don't want to give this person a drug because you're going to test it out. So what we do is we actually generate animal models with the same gene knockout. OK? So that's what we did. OK, so um, I have a lot of fun. I hope you can see this. On this far panel, there's a, a mouse. Mouse is anesthetized, is sleeping. It's got his paws out, tails back here, hind legs back here. OK? And we've never imaged lymphatics in mice. In fact, it's harder to do in mice than in humans. But what we found is that if you put an injection of this dye right behind the tail, I hope you can see this. It goes into the tail. It comes up to the uh, inguinal lymph node. And these mice don't have as many lymph nodes and lymphatics as humans do. It comes up and it goes to the axillary lymph node. Do you see that? And there's pumping, too. So OK, so that's normal. OK, great. OK, let's see what happens when we knock out that gene. So we took the animals and we knocked out the gene. Animals are fine. They're running around the cage, playing, eating, drinking. You know, no problem. And everybody says, ah, oh, there's no phenotype. And I said, well, let's see what we can do if we just do the same injection. OK, so the next panel, same position, but this animal doesn't have any, um, it doesn't have this protein. And so when we inject, yeah, I mean, crying out loud. You know, how lucky can you get in science? <laughs> you know? So what happened was, was this protein was like, it was like, it was a regulator that stopped this aberrant lymphatic growth. And when we got rid of that protein, we had this aberrant lymphatic growth. So, you know, usually we euthanize the animals because you don't want to hang them. You know, it's not fun being in a cage all the time. But we usually, um, we usually euthanize them. And so what we decided to do is let this animal live longer. And this animal ended up with the same 
phenotype is what we just imaged. This is the belly view of the animal, and the animal has chyloacetus, that's leakage in the chyle, and is chylothorax. So these are the animal models that we can use to actually test drugs to try to prevent the phenotype, to prevent the symptom. Do you see the, do you see the way that we do this? OK, so let's go. Let's go to inflammation, fat, adipose deposition. See what we can do there. So we haven't done very much. Um, Karen Harps came to the laboratory, brought some of her patients. We recruited them into our trials. And she brought a patient, and she brought a family with Durkham's. And um, so this is just an image of, and we, we, legs are really hard to do, but, but we've been able to do the legs. The arms are a lot easier. This is the image, a montage of the lymphatics in, in the legs. And they pump. You saw what normal looks like. Okay, they're kind of straight, they're, 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 and they pump uh, fluid. But if we take look at the corresponding views of a Durkham patient, they're kind of dilated. Like that other patient, it's kind of sluggish, an inflammatory response. And there are areas that are circled, hopefully you can see that, right here and here, where there's this endocyanin green that's contained in lymphatics that actually corresponded to um, a fibrotic lesion that, 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 that Karen Herbst actually palpated. You see the lymph vessel, and that's Karen basically palpating this, this mass. So these, these masses are actually kind of like benign lymph tumors. And when she looked at the one that was on the thigh, she's palpating, she says, oh my goodness, and it fills with lymph. She pushes it, the lymph comes up. These are lymphatic. So it's kind of, OK, so look at this. You know, we're, how, when was it that Durkham said that this was a lymphatic disorder? Now we're actually showing it's a lymphatic disorder. Now, when you take families that have this disorder, and we do that same next generation sequencing, what can we find? And, and the idea is, is that it's well, I, I agree with Gwendolyn, this idea of inflammation, the fat deposition around the lymph vessels, the fact that they're leaky, um, may be one of the causes associated with these, these fat disorders. And Manuel um, Gonzalez Gray, who, who found that gene in the, in the Parks Weber syndrome, has actually taken a family from Karen Herbs and found a gene candidate. I can't talk about it right now because it's got to go through the scientific literature. But then what's interesting is there are mouse models that have that gene knockout. So, so if you can see how patients, if you have familial disease, if we can find ways to actually you become part of the research projects, not just research subject, but part of the research project, and we can find those new mutations, those candidates, and understand what signaling processes so that we can develop um, therapeutics. So we're going not from the bench to the bedside. We're going from the bedside to the bench in hopes to go more efficiently back to the patient and to enact uh, a cure. So what I'm trying to point out to you is that science, we're all not all mad scientists. <laughs> we tend to work with the clinicians. And most importantly, it's really the subject volunteers that drive this. So thank you very much. Thank you.